Hi there, everybody, and welcome to Season 2 of For Whom the Cell Tolls. I'm your host, Keenan, and joined again in the studio room is Scout the Pomeranian. Today is actually going to be a very big um, dog day, so Scout is very excited because today's episode is mainly on domestication, which, as we know, dogs are kind of the poster child of, because in this whole st in all these stories of domestication, they've kind of been the ones that come to mind. They're probably the closest like animal that we have a kinship to as far as that kind of cooperative relationship. So although the main subject matter is going to kind of detail behavioral genetics, biology, a lot of the emotional side of these relationships will hopefully kind of be piqued in your interest. So let's get going. First thing I should cite is that the book that I read that really got me interested in this and had me learning more was Domestication, Evolution in a Man-Made World. And it's by Richard C. Francis. So I totally recommend it if it's your library, anything like that, Barnes & Noble, whatever you want to do. It's a really good book because he kind of goes into how each species, you know, what their journey was. So if we start at the beginning with dogs, it's a partnership that goes back, obviously, millions of years. And we really have to start at both sides of the stories. So our human ancestors and what would become humans, so early like kind of proto-humans that, you know, were wandering around, let's say at this stage, they were probably in groups and cooperating by now. So what probably happened is that for a long time, wolves and humans were not friends. Because on one hand, you know, both of them are trying to survive, both of them are trying to eat. It was probably hunting going back and forth on either side. Not a great, not a great relationship to start things out. So like some of the other stories we've started with, what probably happened was one of those immaculate moments, a meeting that only went as well as it did because all the circumstances were right in the right place. So the evidence mounts that dogs, or sorry, wolves, actually probably came to us first because human encampments, because we were a species that would encamp and would stay in a same, the same place for a little while, that causes waste to build up in a certain spot. So animal waste, like what we were eating. It's likely that a wolf with very low fear, and that's a key right there is low fear, probably came into the camp, scavenged for food, found some, and was also, at least at some point, at one of these scavenging journeys that it was brave enough to make into the camp, because they knew they were, we were overall enemies. One of these early human ancestors probably made some kind of contact with this wolf. And at that stage, there became some kind of relationship between wolf, what we'll call wolf kind of patient zero, the very first thing to ever be domesticated, unless you're counting some plants, for example. So what started was a partnership, but what it ended as was kind of a change. It was a divergence of the wolf species. So wolves were, you know, wolves back then, and they went one direction to become wolves today. But this patient zero dog, or sorry, wolf, I keep saying, this, this first wolf that made contact, it was the divergence of what you can call the dog species. It was the first, it was the first one to decide to split. And this is where evolution so plays a part, despite the, the hand that the humans are gonna have in this, is that the circumstances, genetic other or otherwise, that led to that wolf to having a low fear, like threshold essentially, it was not afraid of the humans as much as it should be for them, you know, for all intents and purposes, also met a human with low fear and some kind of partnership worked out. And what happened was that this wolf probably had offspring or they start, or the humans started to realize there was a pattern. They would bring in wolves, have a partnership, probably share their food with them. And this continued for a while until you had a group of wolves that were very used to humans. And it only makes sense that when you're having more wolves and more wolf babies, only the babies that grow up and are okay with the humans are gonna stick around. The ones that were not okay with the humans, they're probably gonna leave or sadly they're gonna die because if they don't have enough, if they have too much fear of the humans, then they lose the advantage of being next to the humans in the camp. Likewise with the humans, this is a two-way relationship. The humans that could domesticate the dogs and, and the, the, sorry, the wolves and had the tolerance for that 
probably formed their own kind of groups as well. And so they also had an advantage. All of a sudden, you have this mutualistic partnership where you have protection from these with these wolves, the humans do. You have extra added protection. The wolves all of a sudden have this free source of food. And maybe it's not like a ton of food, but at least they know that we don't have to fear these things. They're not killing us. They're actually giving us food. And so that's when the selection process really started was humans started selecting for tameness, whether they knew it or not. And with tameness, you can essentially think of it as low fear. The wolves started having so little fear that it became a per permanent partnership. So this is, this is kind of the first story. And like I said, it is an immaculate happening that, you know, one human and one wolf with low fear came together. And, you know, maybe it was more than one at a time, but still that meeting happened and that's what set this all off. So I, I always kind of think that that's a really cool part of the story. Um, and then, you know, humans went on to, you know, of the list of things that are out there that are domestic, you know, cats, cows, caribou, pigs, you can even make the case that certain plants are domesticated and have undergone this process or certain bacteria have. Um, you actually find that there is a scale of tameness that can be selected for. So for example, dogs and cats, dogs actually are selected more for tameness. They're, you know, the domestic dog standard has undergone more generations and more pressure to be tame than the selected cat. That's why cats are grumpy, you know? And that's also why the science is in that, is that you can measure the amount of wildness in something that's left over by how many generations it takes to become feral. So for example, dogs take about three generations to become feral. Now remember, it's not like a Pomeranian's gonna last out in the jungle or something. You're usually talking about, let's say a dingo, for example. It takes about three generations for dingo style dogs to be out in the wild and then for humans to re-encounter them and now these dogs now fear them the third generation second generation not as much they'll still come up to humans they're a little more wild because they've lived their whole life in the environment but they still have the genetics behind it so it's three to four generations for dogs to go back to being feral so that's a measurement of how tame they were in the beginning cats on the other hand usually take about zero to one generation that means you can take a cat out of a house and leave it in the environment without humans for a while, and you can probably classify it as feral. The kittens it has, they can become feral, and they can live and survive right in the wild, and they won't recognize humans again. Sometimes that's not in one generation, maybe it takes two, but the point I'm trying to make is that you can measure how tame a domestic species is by how many generations of offspring it takes before those offspring no longer care or recognize humans as someone you know that as a partner essentially that fear builds back very quickly because it's beneficial in a lot of cases to be have a healthy dose of fear out in the wild not too much fear because you still have to go out and get stuff and eat and you know do all kinds of stuff but think about like a domestic dog being out in the wild and just going up to a grizzly bear and you know trying to say hello most of the time that's not going to work out sadly so the first uh the second story we want to tell this is actually a pretty popular story um, and this is where DNA changes are kind of highlighted. So I think it was in the 1950s or 40s in Russia, there was a fox farm out in Siberia and they were having issues kind of controlling the foxes. They wouldn't breed, they were angry all the time. And so they brought in a geneticist called Dmitry Baliev. And all Baliev did was he would take a glove and put it in a cage with a fox at this farm. If the fox would cower or it would bite, he would say, okay, this one is a fearful one. We're not gonna breed this one. He would take the gloved hand and put it in another cage. If that fox was tolerant, at least, or at least, or maybe even curious, he would say, we will breed this one. Essentially what he was measuring is something we call flight distance now. Essentially, this is what we use to measure fear in animals. So for example, Think about raccoons. Some raccoons have very small flight distances. I mean, they they run away the minute you see them. Others will come right up to you and like ask for food and stuff. This is dangerous when it's a flight distance with like a grizzly bear in Yellowstone or something. That's why they say don't feed the bears because that reduces the flight distance or lengthens it. Whatever makes them less fearful. I'm not an expert in this, remember, I'm just sharing. So Baliev essentially took all the foxes that, you know, had the predisposition of being nice basically they were more tame than their counterparts they weren't tame as we call it so full tame none of these foxes are full tame but he took the most tame ones he had bred them 
and then he bred those offspring, and then the most tame of those offspring. He did this, and over about 10 years, he essentially achieved tameness in wild foxes. Now, 10 years on an evolutionary standpoint is a millisecond. It's nothing. Baliev knew, th knew this, but, you know, for a geneticist, he was still amazed that it took this long. Because even with human direction, Darwin's philosophies were still very ingrained in the geneticists of the time that no matter what you do, this will take years, perhaps thousands of millions of years to accomplish any kind of change. But he did it in a decade. He made domestic tame foxes. One of the best parts about this story, you know, just the leaps and bounds were, you know, of this, of these changes that led to tame foxes that you could hold that would, you know, really like respond to vocalization from humans, things like that, is that there was a domino effect. While he was selecting for tameness, other things came along with it that he didn't intend, but they came along in every single one. There was a physical change. Everything turned, all the foxes, whatever their coat color before was, they turned to mottled gray, black, white. Their ears became floppy. They started to vocalize and bark. And one of the biggest things was that the, the workers on the farm and the owners, they figured out that the foxes, they would give them pet names for fun. The foxes started recognizing their names and coming when they heard their name. You have to understand with how familiar we are with dogs and their traits is that those traits came about because we selected for tameness over those years. And Believ saw this in the foxes because he accelerated the process in 10. With behavioral change came physical change. And that was kind of a crazy finding, something that you could select for, but this whole domino effect comes down with it. And that was kind of the amazing finding was that tameness, tameness in and of itself brings much more with it. So now I think they actually sell the foxes as pets. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but you can, you know, look at the videos of it. They're super cute now. Um, I don't think they use them for their fur at all because they are like amazing and people want a domestic fox and all that. But it's a really, it's a really cool thing that, you know, that was something that happened basically and that he was able to see that all these characteristics that kind of dogs have, at least in our view, they can be brought out by just selecting for that tameness. So on dogs too, I mean, I think I actually watched, this is kind of an aside, but I watched a documentary on German shepherds that service war dogs in Afghanistan, Iraq. And, um, you know, that connection, you know, we talked about the foxes that could vocalize, come back to names and you see it in German shepherds and other dogs with, you know, a lot of personality, not to say that other dogs don't have personality, you know, other than German shepherds, sorry, scout. Um, the connection that those soldiers had with their dogs was amazing. And the word that kept coming up to each of them was, I would treat my dog as if he or she was human. She's part of my family. Some of the stories didn't end well, others ended much better where the dog did become the part of the family in the end. And I just think that that is a very, it's a very interesting connection that this phenotype that we select for, for tameness, brings along a lot more with it than just the tameness. Um, you know, you can really go deep into the relationship between human and animal, and it's, yeah, it's very interesting. So kind of the key things that happen that separate dogs from wolves is this tolerance of humans, which we've selected for with tameness. But the real special thing is that dogs can read human interactions they can read human intentions as well. You can point and a dog will see what you're pointing at, a well-trained one. That's not possible with any other animal on the planet. And this behavior isn't taught. Something changed that made that perception happen. And that's you know something that we still have a really hard time explaining. There's no such thing as a gene that says this, do this animal can now perceive direction. The third thing that they can do is that they can actually tolerize the human gaze. They can accept that. Usually that's a threat in the animal kingdom is staring, but they can understand it and they can kind of read back into it. And that's something that, you know, another kind of this personality that kind of develops. And I'm not saying that you have to tame an animal for it to have personality. I think that that is, 
you know, that's kind of a tough thing to, to cross, but you know, overall, this is an amazing partnership and I focused on, on dogs, I know. Um, and we'll definitely try and focus on animal ethics in another episode because I, I, I still think it's a really interesting concept. So basically to summarize so far where we're at and we'll, we have one more little section. So the third story in this then third and final summarize where we're at, basically Dogs and humans came together at a single moment, and that moment was amazing. Just like when the mitochondria jumped into the cell, and all of a sudden you had eukaryotic cell for the first time, or like a functioning cell, endosymbiotic theory. This is kind of one of those amazing immaculate moments. And I, you know, tell my friends sometimes that when they ask, it's like, I thought that this, you know, there were gradual moments like this. Maybe there were, but there was one that took, as far as we know, and that from that point, those were the domestic dogs, or at least that process was able to happen repeatedly over and over. Um, second thing was, yeah, the selecting for tameness breed comes with physical change. I can't confirm this, but I'm pretty sure that the genes that control adre adrenaline, dopamine, norepinephrine are actually connected to melanin. So when you're selecting for tameness, you're selecting for a downregulation in adrenaline, so fear goes away. You're selecting for upregulation in dopamine, so they're a little happier. And you're also bringing along with that the melanin. So that's why the coats immediately changed once the tameness threshold was reached. And remember, this appearance that they came with, with when tameness was reached, it happened just like that. The next generation, once they were tame, they changed their color. And just in one generation, you know, the final generation for tameness. So that was interesting. Um, third and final caveat, though, or last caveat, I should say, is that... If you look at Scout and you look at a wolf, Pomeranian versus wolf, she, you know, you've seen the stats where it says, you know, 95% shared DNA. And that's actually probably pretty close. It's actually probably a little higher um, as far as complete sequences go. So it's just like the chimps and the humans were not 99.9% .9 alike DNA wise. There's actually a lot of like deletions or insertions or copies that are running around the genome all changing. But for the most part, as far as the sequences, yeah, it's pretty much the same genetic plan. So the real key in all these changes are actually usually epigenetic. And we already talked about epigenetic. These are certain genes that control 20 other genes at a time or 100 other genes at a time. So imagine instead of changing a thousand genes, you change, you truly change three genes to turn on or turn off other genes. And that's how you completely rewire a network of an organism, right? And that's kind of the power of epigenetics. Oh, sorry, epigenetics. We harness this in cancer sometimes, um, cancer therapies. And I know, yeah, this is a cancer podcast. We haven't talked about it. Um, but for the most part, domestication does lie in DNA, but it really lies in epigenetics. And the real, the last thing is that it lies in something else that I actually don't have the largest expertise in, and that's actually development. A lot of the tameness selection actually comes from the fact that you're selecting for kind of this puppy stage. Now, wolves, even wolf puppies, they go through the stage where they play and they bite and they're cute and they're fun. Then they get mean, obviously, because they're in the wild and they got to be mean. But in these domestic animals, that tameness, that happy stage, that puppy stage, it never stops. So in a lot of ways, it's not just the DNA and the epigenetics something in the development, like there's a certain light that just never gets switched off. And this is, I cannot remember the word from the book in this, but it's essentially, yeah, you stay in that no fear, low stress mentality that puppies have been like kind of stay in the whole time. So DNA, epigenetics, and development. Those are the keys to tameness. Okay, let's see how much time. Oh, not too bad. I do try to keep these under 20 minutes because I don't know how long of a commute anybody has. So, um, to the third and final story, um, to warn everybody before this final story happens, you know, we've talked about domestication, tameness, those words are just part of the English language and sometimes they won't get across what this third story is going to go over. And, you know, my apologies for the ineffable qualities of what the concept that we're going to kind of address here that the book addresses. Second thing about this next story is that, don't get me wrong, it's very interesting. You don't need to subscribe to the idea, you don't need to be offended by the idea, um, and you most certainly don't need to 
think that this is like written down in law. This is mainly the brainchild of, you know, truly focused behavioral geneticists, psychologists, and maybe it is just that in that it's something that is for them just interesting. So, essentially, we've studied the process of tameness. And one of the things that emerges is that, well, there's actually a connection. The connection starts with why humans are successful. Why did we dominate the planet? The answer has never really been our intelligence. Our basic individual intelligence is pretty low when you think about it. If you just don't learn, you know, you'd end up kind of like Tarzan, for example. And that's, you know, assuming a modern person would be left in a non-learning environment. So humans, or as they were, our ancestors, were strong individual beings, but not terribly well off on their own. And like all animals, we had a certain flight distance. We had fear. We especially had fear of ourselves and other humans, for example. The power of humanity comes from a degree of cooperativity. And that cooperativity needs a lack of fear. It needed a lack of fear. It needed tolerance of another partner to be accepted into a group and to be allowed to cooperate. Those humans back in the, okay, back, you know, millions of years ago when we're, you know, we're evolving, our ancestors, those that did not, though, or no, I should start, those that had too much fear and could not join a new group or cooperate with another human had a very much a lowered chance of survival and a, thus a lower chance of offspring. Therefore, a lot of people conclude that the cooperativity and the low fear were found in successful human ancestors because then they formed groups. They were able to solve problems that a single one couldn't. Their ancestors that weren't able to join that group, they were left away and they never evolved because they didn't succeed alone. They didn't succeed in too small of a group. So what we're getting at here is that tameness and you know, that's where I'm saying this word is not going to be able to apply to two different things. Human tameness or human ancestor tameness and animal tameness, as far as we can say it in the English language, I wish there were two different words, but essentially those humans that were calmed down, essentially the stress was lower and the cooperativity could happen, they were successful. The hypothesis is that we kind of self-selected for tameness and that humans quote unquote domesticated themselves. Now I use the word hypothesis. Remember that that's not as strong as a theory. Hypothesis is simply we've put together an idea. We think it's an educated guess of what could have happened. So don't, you know, this is again, just an idea like we've said on these podcasts that you can think about on your own. So the idea is that successful human ancestors were successful because the most successful ones were the most, I don't want to say tame, but they had the least amount of fear of each other. We were able to cooperate. We were able to come together. And that's why humanity is so good. That's why we're so strong is because we did come together. We're a cooperative species. We build on each other's intelligence. We build on each other's, you know, kindness, you know? And so the final thing, and remember, this is, this is not my idea, but this is what kind of the book and what some other, you know, what the idea of tameness kind of culminates into is that the ultimate threshold that we crossed into becoming the most powerful species was facilitated through a beacon of cooperativity, a central goal. And the hypothesis is that belief, higher power, a higher something, the belief in that in what our ancestors had, whatever it would have been, that that central figure or that central idea brought human ancestors together under one, you know, kind of banner, one goal as together. Now, this is more than just a wolf pack or groups of animals. This was, and you know, we've already crossed that. This was something amazing and special. And so the hypothesis culminates that 
it was belief that brought us together and made us truly powerful as a species because we can compound our intelligence, we can solve problems, invent things, only if we stick together. And so that was kind of the central theme in the end of the book. And like, even the author, even Francis basically says like, hey, like, this gets pretty crazy. It gets kind of, it's kind of a scary, weird idea. Um, but that's, you know, that's something that you should think about. And I, you know, students that had questions on domestication, we kind of went into this. And they have every, you know, I had, I had all kinds of different opinions in our discussion. And, you know, I definitely think it was healthy. Because you got to remember, this is all a big, long time ago that we're thinking on, you know, when this could have happened. You really have to remember this didn't happen, you know, you know, 200 years ago or something. Um, this was like a very behavioral evolution jump that they're hypothesizing. Now, there are plenty of other ways this all could have happened. There could have been other centrifying, um, kind of un unifying principles. So that's three stories for today. How dogs met humans, how we kind of uncovered domestication and foxes and tameness. And we saw that genetics kind of carry over with that and that tameness doesn't just select for, you know, just that, that behavior, but it selects for all kinds of new physical features too and other things. And then the final story was, could this have happened to us? Now, there isn't really an answer. It's a hypothesis. Um, so I'll kind of let you think on that. Um, feel free to use the email. Let me know what you think. Scout's sleeping, so she's bored. She doesn't care that she came from wolves. Um, well, maybe we'll show her a picture of one or something. If she could, if she could perceive the TV, that would be helpful, but she probably can't. Okay. In any case, thanks for listening again, and have a good night. Bye.